I actually got started uh, in sports scheduling when I was teaching in the flex time program uh, here at then GSIA uh, in the mid 90s. Um, I took my class out for beers after uh, one of the, the evening classes and I was talking to a student who at the time worked for the Pirates and uh, he was talking about the scheduling and some of the problems they were having. And I thought, oh, the problem doesn't look too big, it looks kind of interesting, shouldn't be too bad. And that's kind of where it stayed for about three months until um, I got a phone call from uh, the student's boss who was no longer his boss. He had been fired by the Pirates. He used to be in charge of all uh, business operations. And uh, he had worked in baseball his entire life. Uh, wanted to stay in baseball, and so he asked me, oh, did you want to go into look into sports scheduling? And that was uh, about 10 years ago. I started off trying to schedule Major League Baseball, but um, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that the techniques and computers of 1996 weren't quite up to creating the schedules, at least not with the techniques I knew about at the time. Uh, and so what I had to do was try to find some smaller schedules to work with. I gave a, an academic talk at Georgia Tech and a colleague of mine who was uh, working with the Atlantic Coast Conference basketball conference uh, said he had some scheduling problems and it turned out that the techniques I had developed in the first couple years were just perfect for ACC basketball. This has been a, a wonderful experience working with Major League Baseball on these problems over the last decade uh, because I've learned a lot of different things. Uh, one, I was stunned by how much uh, research still had to be done in order to really address these problems. These problems didn't look very big, but for technical reasons that, that I think only now are we trying, beginning to understand, uh, these sort of scheduling problems are a lot different than the sort of machine scheduling or employee scheduling or classroom scheduling problems that we've been looking at for decades. They just turn out to be a very rich class of problems. Uh, the second aspect that, that I, I learned and about that, that has been very um, eye-opening is just how little or how difficult it is to get people to understand really what they want out of problems. Okay, For a lot of um, uh, machine scheduling, job shop scheduling, it's pretty clear. You want to get products out. When you try to schedule a sports league, it's impossible to figure out what you really want. So trying to define what the problem is that we're actually trying to solve has been the hardest part um, because you can look at a schedule and evaluate it on a number of different measures. So one measure that's important is the amount of, uh, that the teams travel. They don't want to travel very much, not so much due to cost, but due to wear and tear on players, the difficulty of, uh, uh, of getting everything organized. It's just, it's a pain to travel too much. But uh, another thing they want to do is they want to pretty well spend a week at home, a week away, a week at home, a week away. And that causes more travel because they're always having to come back home. And so even those two main objectives trade off against each other. You add into that all sorts of other objectives. You know, how many summer weekends do you have? Uh, are you at home on Mother's Day? No team wants to be at home on Mother's Day. And so when they look at the schedule, they see that they're all at home on Mother's Day. They'd much rather be at home on Father's Day. So the complication in the objective in trying to figure out whether something's a good schedule comes from a, a two aspects. One, there's a lot of things you can measure. And so the trade-offs are not clear. How do you uh, decide whether you will have more travel in order to get closer to the ideal week on, week off? The second aspect is that there's too many decision makers. There are there's the Central League, there are the people who televise the games, there's the fans, there's the players, 
and there are 30 owners of these teams, each of whom has their own objectives and, and goals. And uh, if you know baseball owners, they're not shy about tell telling you about it. So when you have dozens and dozens of different decision makers, and all of these people will decide whether they will accept a schedule, if not formally, then by deciding whether to go to games or whether to televise them. Uh, when you have that many decision makers, it's very difficult to get the trade-offs done right in order to make people happy. One advantage we have is that we have many years of their past experience. And so part of what we try to do is try to make everybody happier than what they were before. And all of them are going to be unhappy in some way. But they're used to being unhappy, okay? They're used to recognizing they can't always get what they want because they see the other decision makers too. And so right now in a transition period, we're in a good period because all we have to do is be a bit better than what was happening before. Well, let me say a few words about the competition in scheduling. Um, the main competition has been Henry and Holly Stevenson of Long Island, New York, who have been scheduling Major League Baseball since the mid-80s. Every year for two decades, Henry and Holly would bring out their whiteboard and magnets and put together schedules, um, primarily by hand, I believe. Now, a lot of uh, what they do then depends on fitting together patterns that they can understand and know how to use. Major League Baseball looks at two schedules and tries to pick out which one they want to use. Um, they've got a 50-page report for each of the two schedules, which measures the schedules in dozens and dozens of different ways. And then Major League Baseball will go through and look at the schedule series by series, game by game, to try to get an overview of which schedule is going to work better for them. Which schedule they choose depends a lot on who they are listening to at the time and what their objectives are at the time. When they are very concerned with TV's uh, ratings and uh, the TV um, uh, games being shown, they will hone in on what the TV schedule is going to look like. And they, at some point they may just call everything else a tie and look only at that. At other times, they will be looking at, um, you know, they've been getting too many complaints from teams about long travel. They may go straight into travel. It's very difficult for us to know beforehand what they will be focusing on. So we do try to create schedules that are good on all measures. Um, and Henry and Holly and, and the other uh, groups that try to put together sc uh, schedules do, do the same thing. Uh, there are things in our schedule that point to the schedule as ours because there are just things that we do that we can't avoid. So often in our schedules everything is going to be perfect except a few teams are going to have just a horrible road trip. And we hate it, we wish we could avoid it, but at the end our techniques, our objectives, our measures of schedules always have that aspect. And we're working at getting rid of it but at the moment the techniques aren't strong enough to do so. A lot of the research in operations research, particularly in areas like data mining, have made it very clear that human pattern recognition is a very powerful method and for many approaches or many problems, uh, human pattern recognition can be the right thing to do. I like the debate. I like trying to take what I know of operations research and show that, in fact, it is strong and it can address these sorts of problems. So I like the conflict between the human side and the computer side. So one of the hardest aspects of trying to create the models and solve the models is knowing when to break the rules. And that is something that the, uh, the human intuition is really, really good at. If I take Henry and Holly's schedules and I put them into my program, my program says that their schedules are infeasible, they're not allowed. And the reason is they break rules that I have. The rules that I have are correct 99% of the time. 
Henry and Holly are able to use their intuition to determine what that 1% is. And that really gives them a good advantage. Um, the thing that I'm able to do, though, is I can do the brute force search that the organization can use. If we take what we've learned field-wise, um, that is faster computers, better algorithms, uh, better data, um, then what does this work in sports scheduling add to that? And I think one of the things that this work in sports scheduling has uh, pointed us towards is a willingness to work in problems with lots and lots of different objectives. Um, in a lot of real-world problems, there's only one objective, make money, okay, or do things quickly. Something like that is a standard objective. But there's a lot of examples out there where there are many, many different objectives and you have to start trading things off. You have to generate not one answer, but many, many answers. You have to be able to uh, take a solution which is good except for one little piece and correct that piece without getting rid of what's good. All of that is stuff we've been doing within sport, the sports scheduling example, which, which I think is moving us forward in making thing in expanding the use of these various techniques. First, this problem came because I'm a Tepper faculty member. Uh, yeah, it could not have happened except for the fact that we have a great group of very involved flex time students who are willing to go out and talk about scheduling and optimization and stuff after class. Um, how does this now translate back into the Tepper School? Well, this is part of the curriculum for a course that I teach uh, called OR Applications where we uh, spend a mini trying to look at the wide variety of ways that operations research techniques are used uh, in, in practice. I talk about sports scheduling for about half a class, um, and uh, some people get really get into it, and there's a, a, a huge literature, a, a lot of different interesting problems to look at. But I think it comes out more broadly in a lot of the operations research teaching I do not so much when I'm talking about doing sports scheduling, but when I talk about the difficulties in trying to implement operations research solutions because the hard part is interacting with clients and trying to get solutions that people can use in practice. And uh, this is, sports scheduling is a great example of it, but it's got nothing to do with the techniques of sports scheduling per se. It is just how do you go out, how do you understand what people need, how do you referee the various conflicts they may have internally so that you can come back with solutions that the organization can use.